Now that we have an example of such a block cipher, we're going to want to talk about security. So what could we say about security, let's say, of, of, um, of DES? Before we can assess the security of, of a block cipher in DS in particular, however, we need to delve more into what exactly are we asking or looking for in that security. And that's an intriguing question, which is not necessarily as simple as it may seem. And this is where we'll start getting into more theory. But it's also a question that's very important if you don't know what exactly you're seeking, it's rather hard to know whether you have something valuable or not in your end design. So now we will, for a moment, back off to a little bit more abstraction. So we're no longer thinking necessarily of a specific block cipher like DES, but a general one. And we're trying to understand in some usage, what are the security properties in which we're interested. So let's fix some arbitrary block cipher. There's a key space, an input space, and an output space. And um, the block cipher is entirely public. It's known to the adversary and the users. Just like DES, every element of its design is public. Security is based only on the fact that Alice and Bob share a key that the adversary doesn't a priori know. They picked it at random from the space of keys and the space of keys is hopefully large enough that that puts a fair amount of uncertainty in it. We call that key the target key because it's the target of the adversary. We think of the adversary's goal as being to get its hands on that key. Why? Because that allows it to decrypt anything. The kind of usage we're considering at the very first cut is that Alice encrypts a message M by just running the block cipher on M with her key, which she shares with Bob, and sending the resulting ciphertext to Bob. And she can do this many times for many different messages, but always with the same fixed key. The key doesn't change in all of this. The adversary gets this list of ciphertexts and maybe it wants to figure out the original messages. We are considering now that the adversary's goal is going to be to figure out the key. Why? Because if it does that, it's rather easy to recover the messages. It's in the same position as Bob it can run the reverse block cipher with the key k and efficiently discover what the message is. So the key, as the word indicates, is the key to the puzzle, and that's what the adversary wants. Okay, now if you look at the third line here, we said that the adversary gets these ciphertexts, but I actually also gave it the messages, and that starts sounding a little weird. If the adversary has the messages, why are we even looking at this and how did it get them and what's this trying to do? This is heading into something that happens quite often in these crypto models and definitions, which is that we model worst case scenarios and we try to be conservative. In reality, we don't expect the adversary to know in, its, in their entirety all of this data, but we might assume that it knows something about it or that it knows a few such messages. There are many ways that could happen. Data isn't random. You're sending emails. They have fixed headers, certain fields that the adversary might know from context. Um, information can be revealed a posteriori. What that means is that you send a message saying, let's meet tomorrow at 5 p.m. And uh, after the meeting, everyone knows it took place. And someone who had seen a ciphertext encrypting that message knows a posteriori that that's what it says, and they can exploit that to maybe decrypt other messages. So for many reasons like this, we set up the problem as saying, I'll actually give you the messages and ciphertext. You try to figure out what the key is. Okay, so we are now going to formalize this, and we'll see what it means to formalize it. We'll use something called games. When we do that, we'll see that there are actually multiple possible formalizations, and we'll be interested in two of them. One of them is called target key recovery, and the other is called consistent key recovery. But since the latter is what we'll almost always use, I'll just call it key recovery. And in each game, in each case, the definition involves something we call a game, and a number associated to an adversary we call an advantage. The bigger this number, the better the adversary did. 
Although our first interest is block ciphers, these definitions are quite general. So they'll allow this E thing to be any family of functions, and this will be important later. We'll, we'll use this in more generality. As we go on in these models, we'll see step by step how they increase adversary power. The idea is to resist adversaries that have more than more capabilities than one might naturally at first want to allow them to be conservative and to model um, situations that are perhaps not necessarily obvious. One of these is what's called a chosen plain text attack. Not only does the adversary know the data you're encrypting in its search for the key, it actually picks it. Okay, very strange. Okay, this is a game to define the target key recovery goal. And we'll be getting into it, you know, slowly and in some depth. But it may be worth starting by noting that in some ways, this is where the core content of the class begins, right? It's not hard to look at the design of DES and say, oh, cool, this is how it works and this is what it does. But there's nothing particularly to understand there. But this here, there is a lot to understand. And this is what's going to arise mostly and much more in what you're tested on, what you play with, and so forth. So this is the time to kind of um, um, pay some attention. OK. We have an object called a game. A game is just an API, uh, 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 an interface in which various programs exist, and the interface to them is exported. As a caller, you can call these programs in certain ways that the game allows you to. The caller of our games is an adversary. So the purpose of the games is to model an adversary's attack on some usage of the primitive, here the family of functions, but in an abstract world. Okay, so the game TKR is subscripted with E. Remember, E is a family of functions because it pertains to or tries to measure the security of E. Right, so this is our, our goal here. It begins with the procedure initialize, which picks a key at random from the key space. This is the key space prescribed by the family of functions E. The game internally stores that key. This procedure is run once, and then the key is fixed. But the key is not exported. Your adversary doesn't know what it is. Now, what does this represent? Intuitively, it's the key that Alice and Bob share. But Alice and Bob don't appear here. They've been abstracted out, and we just have this, this procedure. Now, there's another procedure called fn for function. The adversary can call this with a message m of its choice. This message has to be an allowed input to the family of functions e. And when the game is given that, it simply runs the family of functions, let's say, for example, the block cipher, on input the key k that it chose earlier and this message m. Remember, e takes two inputs, and it gets back some ciphertext c. And that's simply returned to the adversary. The adversary can call this many times, and it will accumulate many different ciphertexts in this, in this way. Now, Notice that what makes this procedure non-trivial in terms of the information it provides to the adversary is that the key k is unknown to the adversary. So it couldn't have computed e of k and m on its own. So when it gets that back, it's, it's information. And what the adversary is doing is it's trying to exploit that information to figure out what the key k is. When the adversary is ready, it thinks, OK, I've learned enough. I've done something. I'm going to figure out what the key is. It'll go to the game, and the game has a procedure called finalize, and say, here's my guess k prime as to the value of k. Did I get it right? The adversary doesn't know that on its own, because it doesn't have the key k, but the game does, so it'll check. k equal k prime with parentheses is a Boolean test returning true or false, and the game will return true if the adversary's guess to the key is correct. It's recovered the car target key. OK, so that's the task for our adversary. Call this FN procedure. You're allowed to pick the inputs, anything you want, get stuff back, and somehow from that, figure out what the key is. And if you do that, you win the game. Otherwise, you lose the game. If you want to think again how this maps back to usage, FN represents Alice. 
these are the messages Alice sends, except this is a rather obliging Alice who will send whatever messages the adversary wants. Now, everything here involves probability, starting from the fact that the key itself is chosen at random. So whether the adversary wins or not is not an absolute fact, but an event in a probability space. Sometimes it'll win, sometimes it won't. So what we're interested in is the probability that it wins. Formally, when you run the adversary with this game, there will be some probability that the game returns true. And we refer to that probability as the advantage of the adversary. We subscript it with the family of functions E because that's the object whose security we're measuring. We superscript it with TKR to indicate that we are following the TKR game. And we give A as an argument because the probability here is for a very specific one choice of A. As you change A, you will get different advantages for different A's. Okay, so every A with a fixed game gives rise to a particular number that's called its advantage. Okay, so um, the text below the slide, below the, the games here, simply writes down all the stuff I've said and um, uh, that hopefully is useful when you go back and uh, look the slides over. Okay, so um, we're going to exercise and exemplify this definition quite a bit in what follows, and um, hopefully that will clarify it more. But um, before we get there, let's finish this definitional quest by also giving the second definition, okay, which is security under for recovery of consistent keys. So notice the, the, the element that we are going to be interested in here in the prior game is that the adversary won the prior game when it found the target key. It found the key that the game had picked, the key that was used by the FN procedure. We are now going to relax that. We're going to give the adversary more ways to win. Effectively, there could be other keys it finds, not the target one, and we will still say, fine, you won the game. And we're going to put some condition on the keys that, that um, defines what allows us to say that. So let E be our family of functions. Again, remember, this. think of this as maybe DES or even something simpler. It's fixed and public. Imagine that we have some input-output sequence, message ciphertext pairs. One message M1 and its corresponding ciphertext C1, but not just one such, many of them. And you think of them maybe as produced by encrypting under a key. So you encrypted M1, you got C1. You encrypted M2, you got C2, and so on. And in all this queue of them. Okay. But in this definition, they're just strings. The M's coming from here, the C's coming from here. Now, suppose I take a particular key in the space. I want to ask what it means to be consistent with this sequence. Consistency with this sequence is defined as saying that it explains the sequence. It maps each out input to the corresponding output. Okay. So if I apply E with this key, to the first message, I do get back the first ciphertext. If I apply it to the second message, I get back the second ciphertext. If these Q equalities are all true, then this key is said to be consistent with this input sequence. Okay, so that's a definition. How it enters security, we'll wait to see. But let's just make sure we understand the definition first. So here's an example cipher. It's a two-bit keys, two-bit inputs, two-bit outputs. These are all the keys, these are all the inputs, and the corresponding table entry is the result of the cipher with the corresponding key and out input. For example, with key 0, 1 and input 1, 0, we get output 0, 1. Okay, now take a particular input-output pair. Here's an input 1, 1, here's a possible output 0, 1. Any two-bit strings can be placed in these positions. I just happen to choose these. This is a sequence of this form. It's a sequence where Q has the value 1. There's only one thing in the sequence. 
Here we see the sequences of length two, but this one is a good starting point. This key zero zero is consistent with this input output example. Why? Because consider this input one one. What is the output under key zero zero? It's zero one, which matches this. That's all, that's what consistent means, okay? This key is consistent with this because it maps this input to this output. For the same input and output, there's another key that's consistent with them. Look at this key. It also maps 1, 1 to 0, 1. It's also consistent with this input output. Okay. Now let's move to two examples. This is Q equals 2. Remember, each example is a pair. So here's the input of the pair and the output, and then again another input, another output. This key, 0, 0, is consistent with that sequence. Why? It maps 0, 1 to 0, 0, as per this. It maps 1, 1 to 0, 1, as per this. So it's consistent with both. Key 1, 1 is consistent with this pair. Why? It maps 0, 1 to 0, 0, as per this. It maps 1, 1 to 0, 1, as per this. Okay. So we now know what it means for a key to be consistent with some sequence of input and output examples. Okay, so our quest now is a second definition of security under key recovery for a block cipher or family of functions. I want to give another game and another definition of an advantage for that game. The basic task is exactly the same. We have our fixed family of functions. The game will begin by choosing a random key from the space of keys and fixing it internally. It's not given to the adversary. The game is now called KR. It's subscripted by E because it depends on this E. And the adversary's goal is going to be key recovery in some sense. The procedure Fn is unchanged. You give it a message M, it applies E under this key to M and produces a ciphertext and just gives that back to the adversary. Okay, what is all this other stuff? It's just bookkeeping. For some reason, this game wants to count and remember how many messages the adversary queried here. So it initializes a counter here, Whenever this is called, you increment it and you store the message as m sub i. The adversary doesn't care about any of this. It just gets back the result, which is the same as before, e applied to m sub i under the key k over here. So far, there's no change with target key recovery. And even here, as far as the interface goes, there's no change. The adversary trundles along. Having called this and got a bunch of ciphertext, it says I'm ready to guess the key. Here's what I think it is. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. And now we see a difference. And the difference is that whereas in the past we told the adversary to win, you need to find this key k, we now relax the condition. We say, if you find the key k, great, you, you certainly won. But there are other ways to win. There are other things you might find that I will also say is um, victory. What is the condition for victory? It's that the key you present has to be consistent with the input-output examples created through this. Right? So m1, c1, m2, c2 is a sequence of input-output examples. Return a key consistent with that, even if different from the target key, and you win the game. So this simply tests that consistency. When is it true? If for every example you have, so for j going from one to the current value of i, if I run e with this key on the corresponding message, I should get back the ciphertext. If it doesn't happen, then I don't win, okay? So if one such thing fails, I set win to false, and I return win. It's initially set to true, so it stays true only if this is an equality, not an inequality, for every choice of j. Okay, so um, now there's a technical condition here. We'll see a little bit later why it's important, but somehow this adversary is requested by this to not repeat queries here, 
If it creates the same message M twice, it's not going to win the game. No smart adversary would ever bother to query the same message twice because it's just going to get back the same answer it got before. It doesn't help. It's just a waste of time. So this doesn't really restrict the adversary, but we'll see that it enables us to discuss security in somehow a, a more meaningful way. Okay, so, um, and th the way that arises is effectively captured by, by this um, uh, definition over here. We call A a Q query adversary if it makes Q distinct queries to Fn. So the distinct is important. The reason we do this is that the more queries you make, the harder it is for a key to be consistent with them because as you make more, less and less keys will be consistent with the full list of input-output examples. But we'll get to that later. Okay. So how do we kind of think about or understand these different metrics? Um, well, I guess I forgot to say over here first off that again, as usual, there's a probability of winning the game for any particular adversary, and that gives rise to its advantage, which is simply that probability. The higher this is, the better the adversary is done, the lower it is, the worse it's done. So um, one way to understand this is to see that consistent key recovery simply relaxes the winning condition for the adversary. If an adversary can win uh, the target key recovery game, it will certainly win the consistent key recovery game, but not necessarily vice versa. If I tell the adversary, you have to win target key recovery, that's a harder task than if I tell it you have to win consistent key recovery. Why is that? Well, the key observation is that the target key is always consistent with the input-output examples coming from your oracle. Um, in case I didn't say it before, we call this FN procedure an oracle because it's something kind of in the sky given to the adversary. So the FN oracle will return M1, uh, C1 in response to M1, C2 in response to M2, and so forth. And we know that they're related by C1 equals E of K and M1 and so forth, where K is the target key. That, by definition, means the target key is consistent with this input-output example list. So if the adversary returns a target key, it'll definitely win both games. But it could win this key, the consistent key recovery game even without returning the target key. And that translates to this. It says if you have any family of functions and any adversary um, making some distinct queries to its oracle, run it in the first game, it'll have some advantage. Run it in the second game, it'll have some advantage. But this number will be always at least as big as this number. Okay, so, um, so let's start exercising these. And while doing that, really what we're trying to get at is one of the most basic security elements of a block cipher or a family of functions. It's kind of the first thing one has to know with regard to designing or using them. And uh, that's called the exhaustive key search attack. So an attack means that I'm going to present you a specific adversary, a strategy, and this strategy is going to play the games we've described, and it's going to try to win, and we're going to measure its advantage. If the advantage is high, the adversary is doing well, that means effectively that we're a little troubled about our design. And if it doesn't do well, well, maybe the design is looking good. Exhaustive key search is an attack that actually works in principle for any design. We'll have to understand how in the face of that we can retain any security. Okay, so fix our function family. To be specific, you might think it's DES, but it could be anything else. It has a certain space of keys. We've called that the set keys. For DES, it's the set of all strings of length 56. We can enumerate the elements of that set. If they're 56-bit strings, it's just 000, 000 uh, up to 111, right? So I'll just, in some canonical way, list them 
as t1 through tn, where n is the size of the key space. Okay. Similarly, I could enumerate the domain. So the input space d, let's list its elements as x1 up through x sub little d. Okay. This exhaustive key search adversary or attack has a parameter called q. So in other words, different adversary, every time you change q, you have a different adversary. And now we'll see how it works. What makes this possible is a very simple fact. We have a finite key space. There are n possible keys. The adversary's goal is to find the key being used by the game, which in an overlying application is the key being used by Alice and Bob. If there are only a finite number of keys, just try all of them. Just test each key and see when you get the right one and you'll win the game, you'll find the key. And great, that works. The only thing is though, you have to think a little bit, how do I do the test? How do I test that a key is correct? Um, well, that's where this um, input output examples come in. So let's look at the adversary. It's subscripted EKS to denote as the exhaustive key search adversary. What does it do? It first goes to its um, FN procedure or Oracle and calls it on some messages and uh, gets back the corresponding ciphertext. It does this Q times for Q different messages and it's for, for um, uh, concreteness just the first Q inputs from the input set. You should think of this number Q as being small. The, the starting example would be just one, just one example, but maybe two or three, but not, not a ton. As you write this adversary, remember, we have to play within the rules of the games we wrote. So the adversary is, has to call the procedures in the interface, that means Fn, and it has to return an output, which automatically becomes the input to the finalized procedure. So here it's calling Fn, it's accumulating these Cs. Okay, and now it's going to trundle through every possible choice of key in the set T1 through Tn. And for each of those choices, ask itself, is this the one that my game has in its secret place? If not, is the next one the one? And so forth. To do that, it tests every candidate. Now, one of those candidates has to work. So eventually it will find the right target key. So what is the test? It um, takes the key T sub i from here and it runs the family of functions on it with this same message from here and sees if it gets back the same ciphertext. This equation would be true when T sub i is the key that's sitting behind this oracle here. So if T sub i is that key, you'll click on all these tests and then you'll return the right key. And that's the intuition. Of course, you might also some other times return it. That's okay, we'll think about that later. Okay, so attacks are described by algorithms of this form. Okay, And one of the elements of this algorithm in particular to note, what is the E here? Well, E is this family of functions. Here, the adversary is simply running its own code or software that implements this function. Remember, the function is completely public. If I have a key and a message, I can run it on them and get an output. So it's using its own software here. Not here. Here it's calling a game procedure or oracle. And the reason it has to do that is here it doesn't know what key is being used. Here it does. Okay. So our question now is, um, let's ask, now that we have a precise adversary strategy, how well is this doing? So what actually is the advantage of this um, adversary? And we have two metrics, right? We have consistent key recovery and target. So let's start with the, um, with the consistent key recovery. And I want to know what is the probability that this adversary wins the game? What is the probability that it finds a key K prime and returns it here, such that when finalized in this game evaluates, It'll say, yes, you win. 
As usual, when you want to do something like this, don't take a guess. Go back and look at the game. So the game tells you how you determine whether the adversary wins. When the adversary submits something here, you look to see if these conditions are true. That means k prime has to pass all these tests. It has to be the case that when e is run on k prime and m sub j, you do get back c sub j for all values of j. Okay. For the adversary to win this game, it must be true of whatever key is returned here. Once you see that, you see that the answer is quite simple. What is being tested here is exactly what will be tested here. So k prime is t sub i, it's what's returned, right? So if the adversary already tested this and determined that this was equal to this, of course the game will discover exactly the same thing. So what does that tell us? It tells us that when this is returned, for sure, the game will like it, it will return true. And so the answer is that the adversary um, uh, advantage is one. Um, so we've been able to quite simply see how to write an adversary that with 100% probability is successful. It's effectively violated security by finding the key. Okay. So um, we're not yet done with this attack because we now want to turn to the other question. Suppose I ask, we look so far at the consistent key recovery game, what is the probability that it wins the target key recovery game? I'm not changing the adversary. I don't need to because the interfaces of the two games are identical. The only change is in the finalized condition and how it return, decides to return true or not. So I can ask, does this adversary win the target key recovery game and with what probability? Again, to assess that, I go back to the game. I look at this game and say, okay, um, did you return the, as when it, the adversary returned this key T sub i, is it equal to the key that the game chose over here? Because that's the condition to win. Okay, so let's try to see if we can determine that. And the k refers to the key hidden inside here. And here it returns true if um, these tests succeed. What we have to then ask is, does this key t sub i equal that key hidden in here? And this is where things get kind of a little more subtle and interesting, and eventually also explain why we even have these two definitions. Because the answer to this is that I really don't know. Um, what I do know is that if in this search I hit the target key here, which has to happen sometime, then of course I will win the target key recovery game. The problem is that before I do that, I may hit another key which satisfies these conditions and return it. That's fine for the consistent key recovery game, but I would lose the target key recovery one, right? So say there's some, uh, so k will always equal some t sub m for some m, but suppose there's an i smaller than that for which all these tests succeed, then that is what's returned and the game is lost. Okay, and now one might say, well, can't we somehow determine something? Like maybe there's some probability with which that happens and we can thus say something about the advantage. This turns out to be quite difficult. The determinants very centrally on the structure of the uh, cipher or family of functions E. And in general, it's very hard to make any statement about how likely this is to return the target key. That being said, in practice, when you look at block ciphers that people have actually designed like DES, the sort of rule of thumb or heuristic that they have is that once you have enough input-output examples that Q is large, say larger than the ratio of key length to input length, then we expect that when you find this key K here satisfying this condition, it actually will be the target key. And so this, this advantage will be close to one. Okay. For example, for DS, the ratio is 56 divided by 64. So Q just has to be one and we expect to get the target key. 
should be clarified that this is not a formal claim or statement. It's just a heuristic. So there's no reason it has to be true. We have no proof it's true for DES, um, so forth. Okay. So um, this is a little exercise that you can play with in your copious free time to help you um, understand these different metrics of key recovery. The aim of this exercise is to demonstrate how the two metrics are so fundamentally different from each other. So what it does is it says build a block cipher. It will be a contrived one. You can do some weird stuff because you control the design of this block cipher. And the properties it has is that it will be extremely secure against target key recovery and while widely insecure against consistent key recovery. So you will give an adversary which is very fast, which has a high advantage of one against consistent key recovery, and yet you will show that it's actually impossible for an adversary to recover the target key. So it's a fun example. You can figure out how you want to do that. Okay. So let's pause here to um, talk a little bit about what um, we've done so far in a pedagogic sense in terms of how you're going to develop your understanding and what to pay attention to and so forth. So the first few slides of this chapter is just kind of notation and definitions, discrete math level, and that's something you ought to find quite easy. The description of DES, it's, it's a nice, uh, fun thing to look at, but it's just a story. So if you think that you understood that, well, that's great. But on the other hand, it's not like there's anything much to understand. It's mostly a description, okay? But the place where there is a lot to understand is what we just did, the whole subject of key recovery security the games that capture it, the advantage definitions, the exhaustive key search attack. And this you have to go over and over again. So you have to go back to the games, stare at them. It can take significant amount of time looking at those games and playing with them to figure out how they work. As the class goes on, you'll get a lot more practice with this. But at first, it can seem a little bit daunting. So take the time to really think about and look at those games. Okay.